Thus, the differential diagnosis for each can be a very long list. In fact, the pieces just given have been reduced from a very long list to the most common one thing. Even so, the patient is not investigated for all the diseases. It is not possible, nor is it a good idea. We have to narrow down the differential diagnosis further before ordering the lab test. How do we do that? How do we narrow down the differential diagnosis further? By now, we know the patient has anterior or intermediate or posterior or familiaritis. We know the list of causes which can cause each of the deviators, but which one of them or which group of them are responsible for the symptoms and in this particular patient. So we have to take help of some more clues. One of this is time course of the disease, whether it is an acute disease, chronic disease, a recurrent type of disease. Second, type of inflammation. Is it a granulomatous type of inflammation or a non-granulomatous? We are not doing a histopathological examination for this. In fact, we are just looking at the little gland into the eye and then getting clues which say that this is a granulomatous that I see or not. That will come to you Characteristic pattern of the lesion. The uveitis, for example, let's say posterior uveitis, it can present in a particular pattern which is seen only in one disease and not in another. For example, toxoplasma, it has got a very characteristic pattern. So, in such types of lesions, characteristic pattern of the lesion will lead us to the diagnosis. Demographic data is extremely important. In fact, taking history is very important in uveitis patients. And age, sex, race, social history, these are definite modifying features in our central diagnosis. Lastly, and not the least, associated systemic features. The importance of this cannot be overemphasized because systemic associations are very specific to each of the diseases. So, we have to take the history and examine as far as is possible for all the systems of the patient, there is the skin, the CVS, the DIT, so the neurological examination, and uh, this will give us in the right direction. General pointers, uh, anterior uveitis is the most common type of uveitis, and have already said that. Idiopathic form is the most common cause of anterior uveitis. Infections are more common in the posterior uveitis group. Sarcoidosis tuberculosis and syphilis can present in any or all locations and hence the investigations and orders will almost always contain tests to rule out these conditions. So, the other clues, time course. If it's an acute uveitis, acute uveitis is sudden in onset and lasts up to six weeks. Chronic, which is insidious in onset and definitely lasts longer than six weeks, sometimes is three months. Recurrent, repeated attack. But there is a disease-free interval in which no treatment needs to be taken. Examples, acute anterior uveitis, the idiopathic variety is an example for this. Among posterior uveitis, VKH syndrome can present acutely. The most common cause for chronic anterior uveitis is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Tuberculous uveitis, sarcoidosis can also have a chronic time course. Onset is insidious and course is chronic over months and years. The recurrent idiopathic anterior uveitis is very commonly seen as a recurrent disease. It affects one eye, it's treated. After a while, after a few months, it affects the other eye, that treated. And then again comes back to the first eye, or it may be the same eye. VK syndrome also can have recurrent episodes which need to be suppressed by steroids and uh, immunosuppressive. Type of inflammation as granulomatous or non-granulomatous. As I said, it is not a histopathological diagnosis, but looking at certain findings, we can come to a conclusion that it probably is one of the granulomatous or non-granulomatous. Granulomatous type of uveitis has a insidious concept as against the acute in non-granulomatous, but most important findings relate to the keratic precipitates and iris nodules. The keratic precipitates, as you know, are the clumps of cells that get stuck on to the endothelium in uveitis, generally anterior uveitis. Now, when these are large, greasy, lardacious, the word term also uses mutton fat because they look so oily and greasy, and they're definitely large, and these are to a millimeter white in color, and that is so pathologically, they are made up of macrophages and epithelioid cells. So, mutton fat cases, granulomatous uveitis. Non-granulomatous, they're fine, they're very small, 
the white in color and they are actually made up of lymphocytes and plant muscles. Next, iris nodules. Nodules are not present in non granulomatous They are present only in granulomatous They are probably more specific to granulomatous than even the KP. Kepi nodules at the pupillary border, any nodule at the pupillary border is called a kepi nodule. And when they are found on the iris stroma, they are called as Bukaka's nodule. When they are found in the angle, they are called Berlin's nodules. Now these nodules are specific for granulomatous viviitis. Associated fungus features, there could be granulomas or nodules in the choroid in granulomatous variety. And as I said, the course is chronic. The posterior sinusae are broad based and many in granulomatous, maybe fine or non in non granulomatous. The importance is of knowing whether it is granulomatous or not is that very few specific conditions cause granulomatous uveitis, but almost all conditions, including those that cause granulomatous inflammation, can present as non granulomatous. Therefore, just getting a non granulomatous type of KP probably will not help us in formulating a differential diagnosis, but granulomatous KPs and iris nodules, if present, the narrowing down of differential diagnosis is possible. In clinical practice, it is seen that more commonly granulomatous type of inflammation is seen in infectious causes. Sometimes actual infectious organism may be found in the tissue. Some examples of these cases, here you see that the back of the cornea in the parallelopithid, you will find that it is having lots of small, multiple, fine cases. As against in this next photo, which has cases of varying sizes, both small and large. In this you find large cases, they are round, and uh, definitely these are bigger than the fine cases you saw in the first photograph. These are granulomatous cases. And these are iris nodules, and there are multiple iris nodules on the iris surface, which turned out that the patient had actually tan uveitis. These are the closest photos of the kepi nodules and the kappa nodules, granulomatous uveitis. So, ones at the pupillary border are kepi nodules, and ones on the iris surface are called as the kappa nodules. So, which of the diseases cause granulomatous uveitis? Like I said, infections are more commonly caused in this type of uveitis, tuberculosis, syphilis, herpes simplex, herpes rock. After this, two important conditions, both Koenagi Harada and sympathetic oxygenosis, bilateral granulomatous and uveitis. Sarcoidosis, in fact, presents very similar to tuberculosis. So, these are the common causes for granulomatous uveitis. Which age, which uveitis? Children, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, can be seen in children as young as 4 or 5 years. Toxocariasis is a posterior uveitis seen in children. Adults among the anterior uveitis, the spondyloarthropathy seronegative group, very commonly seen in young adults, males, and among tan uveitis, VKH and Dysis syndrome are commonly seen in adults. When an older person presents with uveitis for the first time, it could be either idiopathic, but more important to rule out macrate syndrome neoplastic variety in these people. Uveitic diseases which can present in any age group, toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis. This is a photo of a cataract in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The pupil is dilated and few posterior sinusae can also be seen. So the children in this group can actually present with cataract the first instance because they have painless presentation field and without redness photophobia. So unless they are screened, it is difficult to pick them up early. Race, Asian, VKH and diabetes are more common. In fact, VKH is more common in people who have dark skin because it affects the melanocyte. Black, sarcoidosis is more common. And in white, the ankylosing spondylite is actually AD27 positive to more common. Socialistic, this can be actually quite, this should be laboriously taken because it can really tell us which investigation we should go for. Contact with pets and cat feces can give rise to toxoplasmosis. Especially pregnant women in contact with this can transmit toxoplasmosis to the infant, to the fetus, and the child is born with congenital toxoplasmosis that can trouble him lifelong 
because the toxoplasma will be active and present in the retina and at various intervals it can become active and give rise to diminished vision or vitritis, uh, retinitis. Contact with contaminated water, rodent urine, electrophorosis uh, is common. Farmers, veterinarians or the hikers in the woods, for example, they can have brutalosis and the history of exposure obviously in tuberculosis, syphilis and HIV. We stop this at this slide. The next part, uh, we will discuss a few cases and put into practice what we have learned in the first part.